Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this planet, and welcome to our SETI Live. So this is a very special SETI Live uh, from the International Astronomical Congress here in Dubai, and I have with me uh, Shane Smith. Hi, Shane, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good. So, Shane, uh, we are here in the booth of the Breakthrough Initiative. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, the reason I invited you to talk today is because uh, you are the first author of a paper published in Nature Astronomy. Yes. And this paper is about uh, the discovery of uh, an interesting, the study and the discovery of an interesting signal called BLC1. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, just, I should mention that you were an intern at UC Berkeley. Yes. And uh, you are here invited on, the, on behalf of the Breakthrough Initiative to attend this uh, amazing uh, congress. Yeah. yeah. All right. It's great to be here. So the paper is out and it's published. It's in Nature Astronomy. I have here a copy. Uh, and we are going to go through the first paper. In fact, there is two of them. And Shane today is going to tell us a bit about the story of the first paper and what was this uh, discovery. So what yes. is BLC1? All right. So uh, BLC1 is... Uh, our, our, our breakthrough listens first uh, candidate signal um, in the initiative, um, and so when we're looking for a uh, signal of interest or uh, a type of signature, we're we ha we're looking for a bunch of different key features, and so uh, the first one is is it narrow band? Um, you know, astrophysical signals are from have a very uh, broad frequency range, mm -hmm. um, and so we're looking for stuff that is narrow and consistent with our own technology and perhaps also technology on other planets. Um, and so that is the, that's the first sort of characteristic we look for. Um, the next thing that we do is we want to make sure, um, since we're looking for stuff that looks like our own technology, we want to make sure it's not our own technology, and so the way we do that is we... Uh, we point the telescope towards our target star, um, our, our source that we're looking for intelligent life in, and then we point it away for a little bit. Um, and so we do that over and over again, pointing on the source and then off the source. Okay. And then um, what happens basically is we look for signals that are only present in the direction of our target. Um, and so that kind of tells us the directionality of uh, the signal. So if it's, if it's present in both, uh, the in the direction of the source and uh, in, a, in a different direction that's going to be consistent with one of our ground-based uh, receivers or uh, transmitters yeah. here. Um, and so that's that's another characteristic we look for. Um, and so also the final characteristic that we look for in our pipeline is uh, the it, it, is it drifting over time. And what happens uh, is basically kind of like the Doppler effect where you have a car with the horn or a siren coming towards you, the pitch gets shifted as it's accelerating past mm -hmm. you. Um, same thing happens with electromagnetic waves, so a transmitter on a planet uh, that's in a different reference frame from us, orbiting around a different star, is going to have a non-zero radial acceleration relative to us, and so that's going to cause it to drift in frequency over time. Um, and so BLC-1 uh, is really interesting because it is the first uh, signal in the breakthrough uh, listen campaign that has met all of these criteria and then also the signal was present in our data for over two or around two hours um, and that's really interesting because most uh, most radio frequency interference from our own technology is short-lived um, bursts of information so it, it's a very very interesting uh, signal that we got. So BLC1 means breakthrough listen candidate yes. number one so it means that you have, uh, this is the first signal that seems to have the characteristic that you, you mentioned, which are very specific for a signal mm -hmm. identical to what you expect to, to hear if you are looking for a techno signature from an alien civilization, right? right? Yes. Yeah, we, may, we forgot to mention that that's what we are doing, but it's a city life, so I'm assuming people know about yeah. that. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to know more concretely what you have been doing, because I'm assuming I'm, you probably don't have your own backyard uh, antenna. No, no you don't do your I do research not. Your, so tell us a bit about yeah. the facility. And, uh, yeah, so um, I got started with uh, the Berkeley SETI Research Center through a summer internship. Uh, I had previously done radio astronomy work at my, my school, Hillsdale College, um, but I, uh, 
I did this internship in the summer of 2020. Um, it was all virtual. And my job that summer was looking at data from the park's radio telescope. Um, and in particular, I was looking at data uh, in the direction of Proxima Centauri, which is the closest uh, star to Earth. Mm -hmm. um, and so this makes Proxima Centauri an interesting uh, SETI candidate because of how close it is. And also there is a, uh, a small exoplanet that is orbiting Proxima Centauri, um, and it's believed to be in the habitable zone. Um, there is some doubt about whether it is actually habitable because you know Proxima Centauri is an M dwarf type star, so it's flaring a lot, and so it's kind of it's very unlikely that Proxima Centauri B, the exoplanet, has any sort of atmosphere. Yeah. Um, so it, it was chosen as a as a target because of all these uh, because of its proximity, basically, and then also. Uh, Another initiative, Breakthrough Starshot, um, their goal is to send a gram-sized, uh, laser-propelled uh, saddle or uh, spacecraft, space, spacecraft yeah. Yeah, in, the, in the direction of Proxima Centauri near the speed of light uh, so that it could take pictures of Proxima Centauri and then transmit it back to Earth, kind of the first uh, interstellar mission. Uh, okay, so that's the target of the mission. And it's also a star which is nearby us, uh, four light years, roughly. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So you uh, point the telescope toward this area of the sky. Mm -hmm. uh, the Park Telescope is in Australia. Yes. Because Proxima Centauri is a star which is visible in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah. That's um, one good reason to have it. Mm -hmm. And um, so you go through the data yourself. Uh, how does that work? Yeah. So we have an algorithm that looks for all these features that I was talking about earlier. Um, you know, narrow band, drifting, only present in the direction of our source. Um, and so basically what I did was I was running uh, this algorithm that we have called Turbo SETI um, on uh, tons and tons of data, around three terabytes of data, um, to find these narrow band drifting signals. Um, and then I, after the algorithm returned, what it thought was interesting, I had to go through uh, I had to go through the results myself and, you know, filter out hand by hand what was actually interesting. And usually, um, this has been done many times before I had done it. Um, so usually it ends up with being none of them are interesting. They're all attributed to radio frequency interference, one of our own transmitters. Um, and so it was my project. Was so this one was very special. Yes. Right. I can show it here. It's on the in this piece of paper. So I don't know yeah. if you see, but there is this line here, right? Yeah. And it, the paper is available online, so you can have a yeah. look. It's the figure four of this paper. So from this signal, so this this diagram shows that this signal is very spe special, right? Yeah. Because you see in and off, etc. Right. So what's the what was the the next step for you when you saw that? What did you do? Um, so I was still pretty new to all of this when I found it. I was I was ex excited because. Uh, uh, you know, it, it met all of our criteria like perfectly. It was like, oh, this is really cool. Um, and so I sent it to my mentor, Danny Price, um, and he thought it was, uh, he, he was way more excited than me, I think. Because oh, wow. He, 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 he had been working with the project much longer than me, uh, and he, yeah, uh, I, he understood the significance of it uh, immediately. Um, and so it sparked a lot of excitement among the other researchers. And once I once I saw that, I, I got really excited. I was like, oh, cool! I actually found something that. Yeah, you found something that we didn't know at the time what it was, and we're gonna have a talk about this in the future. But the point here is that this discovery, the VLC one here, kind of validate the automatic algorithm that you implemented. Yeah, and so on. that's also one of the reasons those researchers were excited is that. With this, they develop tools to process this data, and you basically use those tools, and you come out with a signal, which is very interesting. Yeah, so. yeah, it's a, a great verification mm -hmm. that our algorithms are working, and that it's giving us what we're looking for, basically. All right. So in the paper, you give the characteristic of the signal, the frequency, the number of time it has been uh, observed. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Uh, yeah, sure. So the frequency. Um, I believe it is at 9, 8, 982 megahertz. Um, mm -hmm. The drift rate is very small. It's about 0 0.038 hertz per second. Um, 
and then it occurs over a, a very long time period, about uh, two hours. Okay. Um, so uh, all of those features make it interesting. Um, Sophia, uh, in her paper, they actually do more analysis of it, and they try to do uh, different fits of, you know, what if there was a satellite, you know, and the transmitter beam, is it in an airplane? Could it be like a car driving on a highway nearby? Is it some sort of satellite or geosynchronous or uh, uh, low Earth orbit satellite? Um, and so, so, yeah, so there is two papers. Yeah, in right. This. Okay, this is the second paper. Mm -hmm. And Sophia, uh, we will invite her next week probably to tell us about the analysis of the signal itself. Yeah. But, okay, let's go, go straight to the point. Is that a signal of an alien civilization? No, no it is not. It is not, right? Yeah. right. Just so you know, it's not. <laughs> no, you already know the end of the story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, spoiler but, alert. <laughs> but we will, uh, we will take the time to explain how uh, this, has, this conclusion was taken based on the, uh, the analysis with Sophia next week. So, it's great to, uh, I mean, as an intern at UC Berkeley, to, be, to do such an amazing discovery and to have a paper in Nature Astronomy. Yeah. How yeah. do you feel about that? Uh, it is really exciting. Uh, I never really expected any of it to happen. Like, I was, uh, like, when I found the signal, I was in the process of writing up a paper for uh, another journal. And, uh, yeah, I, I never expected that my paper would end up being in Nature Astronomy. Just kind of kind of blows my mind. <laughs> Good. Can you tell the younger viewers here how you did how you did this? Uh, how did you apply to this internship? Yeah. So uh, I I first started off doing research at my own school, doing uh, radio astronomy research with my academic advisor, uh, Dr. Tim Dolch, and uh, I that's basically how I got into this. Uh, you know, I had the experience with data analysis using Python um, and you know uh, radio astronomy. And so with that experience, I was able to apply uh, to this internship. I think, uh, I think applications for the internship are opening soon, or they might already be open. Okay. Um, so if you only find aliens, you know what you got yeah, there, yeah. right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apply for the internship at the UC Berkeley Study Research Center. Um, highly recommend. It was okay. a great experience. It was a great experience? Yes. I mean, yeah. this is recorded, and the U boss is just uh, you know, by us, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can't, can't talk bad. <laughs> okay. Um, so, what's next for you, personally? Uh, yeah, so I'm in my fourth year of school. I'm a senior. Um, which uh, which uh, school? I go to Hillsdale College. It's a small liberal arts school in Michigan. Good. Um, and so, my, my plans now are grad school. Um, I'm thinking of doing electrical engineering. Um, yeah. Electrical so, engineering. Yes. So that we, what do you want to do? You want to build antennas? I mean, that would be cool. Um, I, I just, I, I like uh, electrical engineering because kind of the flexibility it has, mm -hmm. you know, like I could, I could go into, uh, you know, back into SETI and radio astronomy, um, or I could take a different path, you know, go into the space spacecraft. industry. Yeah, build spacecraft, yeah. We are the International Astronomical Congress, and here there is all the space agencies in the world, mm -hmm. most of the, the big uh, companies and even the small startup working in the, in the space exploration. So I'm sure it's kind of uh, good for you to connect with these companies and see what's going yeah, on. Right? Yeah, it's been really exciting to meet a lot of people and see. see you take the time companies. to go around and talk to people? And, yeah, I have uh, a little bit. I still need yeah. to do a lot more exploring. But yeah, there's, what's, uh, what did interest you, interested you the most at the moment? Besides the Unistellar telescope, uh, <laughs> oh, oh! Besides your telescope last night, um, uh, I like—I don't know—I kind of like walking around and looking at all the the uh, they have like model satellites mm -hmm. hanging up at all these booths. I think it's cool to look at those. Um, yeah, it, it is really cool too to see you know just the diversity here of all the all the different uh, countries and their, their space yeah. agencies. You can see that space exploration is becoming truly international yeah. by being here and, right. and seeing people from all the countries in the world, uh, different places, different uh, people, the way they dress too. I mean, I love that too. Yeah. This is, uh, you can see the diversity in the, in the way people dress. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and the conversation, the languages. The, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's exciting. It is but really exciting. It's, a good, it's good for you to have been to, to be able to see that early so you take a decision for the future of your career. So what about the um, project itself? 
Are you still working with? Uh... Um, no, so I haven't been working as much with uh, uh, with the group anymore. After I've you know got, gotten this paper out, I'm focusing on uh, applying to grad school okay. and finishing my my undergrad degree. Um, but as far as the project, um, it's it's pretty complete. I mean, we uh, Sophia can talk about this more about future work with this project. But uh, there's we still haven't exactly pinpoint you know what the exact source of this signal is. We we have determined that it is ground based radio frequency interference, but um, there is still more research that can be done into really pinpointing what this is. And, uh, All right. And um, I mean the breakthrough. This is BLC one. Do you know if there is a BLC two? Can you say anything about that? <laughs> yeah. I put you on the spot here. <laughs> there is not a BLC two, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. But maybe soon. Maybe soon. All right. Good. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a long church. I mean, search. I mean, it's a, it's a universe is gigantic. There is a lot mm. of stars to uh, listen to. So. Right. Uh, it's great that you have access to facilities like the Park Telescope, the Allen Telescope Array, mm. to do this search for techno signature. And um, that's what we do here, uh, here at the Breakthrough Listen and at the SETI Institute as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Andy. Yeah, thank you. And um, I see you soon. I don't know. Maybe another International Astronomical Congress. Yes. Awesome. Bye bye.